what God has done in and for our nation, especially looking at the European spiritual fathers that God has given us and what they have invested into our people. Because in that lies a blessing, but in that lies a next step that we are responsible for as the next generation. So firstly, I want us to understand that God is sovereign in the affairs of man. That, that we have to understand that nothing happens as a coincidence. Nothing happens out of God's control. In spite of man's sinfulness, God is always busy with seeing His purposes fulfilled. And I see that many of us as believers tend to not see God in the greatness of who He is. We put Him in our little box and we think and live according to that picture that we have of God, which is in itself idolatry. We are, we are worshipping a form of God, a picture of God, a glimpse of God, instead of allowing Him to be God in fullness. So we need to understand that every process that has functioned and worked into our nation was directed by the hand of God. And until we do not believe that, we will not look at history the way God wants us to look at it. I love looking at the, what God did in the past and then we have a wonderful story where Daniel is in Babylon and God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream and he doesn't know what the dream means at the end of the day God anoints Daniel to interpret the dream and we all read about this but for me it reveals how intricately involved God is in the history of mankind. Because God comes to one of the most powerful kings and He tells that king through the dream what will happen after him in detail. If that doesn't convince you of how much God is in control, I don't know what will convince you. The fact that even before certain people groups existed, God already said this is how it's going to be. And Daniel interprets the dream and he says the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Isn't that beautiful? Daniel says this is God Almighty telling you what will happen. Where you are in the scheme of things and what will follow you. And all of that, I mean remember when Daniel prophesied this from the dream, nothing of that yet existed. And yet if you and I look back today and we see that each one of those things happened exactly as God gave the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. So that gives us the confidence to know that God knows long before it happens, God already has a plan and is already working and in implementing that plan. And we are no different in what He has done into and for our nation. I, I, I want to tell people we don't serve a Mickey Mouse God. It's time that we realize we serve a big God. And that we need to get rid of our small pictures of who God is and what God is able to do. If you know God's sovereignty and big, bigness in, in, in the affairs of man, you will have much more confidence in who God is. God sent His messengers from the beginning very intentionally and with wisdom. We read the first time in Acts uh, 8 where it talks about Philip and it says now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. So he arose and went and behold a man of Ethiopia, Enoch of great authority was traveling on that road. I mean that's just amazing. God was unlocking a nation, Ethiopia through the obedience of Philip, but God guided him. He was interrupted by God. An angel appeared to him and said, Listen, Philip, you must now go do this. You must go to that road, because what you're going to do there is going to unlock a nation in receiving the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Can we believe that every other missionary that God sent in every other nation of the world had the same intentionality of God's hand directing them. Can we see that hand and acknowledge it was God, even though they may be vessels of clay, even though we look at the outside and we say we're not necessarily impressed, can we see that God intended that? We look at, we look at Paul, and it's so interesting for me to look at Acts 16 and how Paul clearly states, I mean Paul was zealous, 
Paul wanted to do this work for God. But God directed him very specifically in Acts 16. He says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region, region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Wow. God says, you don't go there. You're not going to preach there. Lord, don't you love the people of Asia? Yes, I love them. But it's not according to my plan yet. I am very intentional in how I am unfolding the kingdom into the nations of the world. And Paul was forbidden from going to Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit did not permit them. Wow. And then he comes in the next verse and he says, in verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. If you're going to hear the story this morning that Yebrat will share with us about the Germans specifically, you will hear God sent them. You have to understand God directed. He chose our spiritual fathers for us. Just as he chose your physical father for you. None of us had a choice in that. Many of us, when I was growing up, I had a great opinion that God didn't do, make a good choice of my parents for me. That's how we tend to look at it when we're young. But God knows what he does when he chooses your parents for you. In the same way God chose our parents very specifically. It was no coincidence that God sent Paul to Europe. He, sent, he wanted the gospel to enter the continent of Europe. And if you look at the whole scheme of history, it makes sense. Because God knew the gift of Europe. And God knew that through that gift, He would be able to reach the rest of the world. He would be able to reach us. So I want us to really see this morning that there are messengers that God sent from Europe, Europe to South Africa and Africa. And these messengers offered so much for our benefit. I want us to become students of history, not for interesting sake, for us to be able to see God and the processes that He has been involved in. Because that will show you that you are highly honored in God's Son. I mean, we, if we're going to hear the stories that's going to be told, and we don't have time to tell them in detail. But the sacrifice that Europeans had to make to come to Africa, what it cost them in body, soul, and spirit to come all this way, to come to wild Africa with all its strange things and dangerous things, it must speak to you about them. How God valued us as a nation. To see what specific nations contributed to bringing the gospel to South Africa. Whether it was England, France, Germany, Scotland, America. There was many nations that invested into South Africa. But I don't think we still have to do the study thoroughly. We've only started looking at the Germans. But I think we'll struggle to find as big an investment into the nation of South Africa concerning the gospel as the Germans invested into this nation. And God knew what He did when He did that. So Everard will start us off by sharing with us about the history of Germany and how it relates to South Africa. Then I will just share a little bit about France and our experience in France and then he'll go into the details of the nation of Germany's investment into South Africa. So you can take out your little piece of information that was in your registration back because he will refer to that now. Thanks, Ira. The scripture that everything that has breath praise the Lord. That scripture sent us on a journey of discovery. And the team sits there, your your and Christine on a journey of discovery and after a day or two in November last year we called it a journey to the soul of our nation. What put us on that journey? Leon often says I have the gifting of research and I still want to be a teacher 
So now and then I'll ask a question and just see a show of hands. And I start with a very easy one. What did people, some communities, celebrate on the 31st of October 2021? Any show of hands, 31st October rings a bell? There is one, one hand. Is there not another? Okay, there is one. Ashley, then I asked you, 31st October. Is he right? I can't. Yes, all right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. That is it. Uh, but we discovered the Reformation in South Africa. On 31st October, we couldn't believe it. We discovered a Moravian church alive across South Africa, a brass band festival on the internet, and I just Hope the music plays. Last band is the Lutheran way of celebration. Yeah. And here we have it, alive in South Africa. Many places where the Herrenhuters went to Labrador, to Alaska, are not alive anymore. But South Africa is alive and so there must be a purpose in that living spirit in our nation and it was not only the music that struck us but the professionalism the artists the combining on the internet from how ten from the whole tape playing together and one day it was a blessing This is a photo we took in 2019, a journey of discovery. We were on a prayer journey in Germany, the one place that couldn't receive us on the day we, we had a program was Herrenhut. Why? There was a wedding in this village and everybody is at a wedding, so nobody could receive us. But God said, you must go. We had a flat in the neighboring village, so that was organized. So the night before, we again phoned three people that we were given. The second one said, come very early for breakfast at the bakery, then I will have time for you. We were at the bakery, and after an hour with him praying together, all eight were invited to the wedding. The wedding that had been the bottleneck became the opening to her work for us. The beautiful thing in our time, maybe 10, 14 days before, a child in the forest discovered a spring breaking out in Herrenhut. That hadn't happened for a long time. And the leader of Jesus House, International House of Prayer, took us there and that is to me almost the strongest symbol that revival yes. will come. Yes. And we know the cities around, big cities like Dresden, people in Czechoslovakia, pray that it will happen yes. in this village. And I've heard prayers here in South Africa. Yes. But I still feel we must pray for the fire mm. that is already glowing mm. to break out in our own nation. 
so wonderful. I call this slide the Count, the Carpenter meeting the Lord of Lords. And through that meeting in Harrenhut, two Reformation streams, the one even older than Luther, yes. Johann Hus, yes. meeting yes. with the Reformation stream of Zinzendorf. And in that meeting, the Holy Spirit started speaking. Initially, they did not even understand each other. They argued about theology. But then the Holy Spirit came over them. Wonderful. Both Zinzendorf and Christian David were hymn writers, people inspired to praise God. And it was so beautiful. People here know Christian David. On the M6, as you shortly before you come to Musenberg, there is the Christian David Primary School, remembering this carpenter. In the end, he brought the gospel to America. Zinzendorf was inspired. He heard how the Hottentot were maltreated in this nation. And he said, there, you, dear Schmidt, must go. This breaking out, I just want to read what happens, what people wrote. It's still the writing there. A great hunger after the word of God took possession of us so that we had to have three services every day. Everyone desired above everything else that the Holy Spirit might have full control, self-love and self-will, as well as all disobedience disappeared. And an overwhelming flood of grace swept us all out in the great ocean of divine love. And then 24-7 prayer started. And in our final session, Daniel will share about that and take it forward in our nation. Amazing thing, in our research we found information on each separate mission society from Germany, but nowhere could I find something on the whole picture. So I want to give you a little bit of that. The first was the Moravians coming from Herrenwood, and they were along the Cape uh, coast, but in the end, the governor of the colony saw their tremendous benefit to peace in our nation that he also brought them further into the east and also into the north. But that was the first thrust, 1737. Uh, that is related to the date of the meeting of the Count and the Carpenter in 1722. And that is why Herrenhut celebrates 300 years of that amazing meeting in the spirit in Herrenhut. The next, the Rhenish mission. And isn't it beautiful? Initially they came as individuals, but worked with the London Missionary Society, which was already in the Cape. The first, one of the first stations they established was beautiful Wuppertal, which later, through when the Rhenish left, the Moravians took over. But that thrust, also initially helped by the London Missionary Society, created close to uh, Southwest Africa, there was not even a name like that, uh, a station, Bethany, and then the Rhenish took it over, and from there they went into my country, Namibia, and evangelized the Nama with their click language and the Herero as proud a nation as the Zulus in South Africa. Translated both the Nama Bible and the Herero Bible. The Rhenish mission, a wonderful, wonderful heritage. <coughs> Out of Port Natal, another thrust, the Berlin Missions Society were the first there and they started evangelizing among the Zulu and wonderful another village village people 
in the north of Germany called Hermannsburg. It's a heath landscape where the people were sheep farmers. Their revival broke out. First they just had mission conferences with 2,000 people attending in the village. And after three years they said, we must go out. They built a ship to go out. They built a ship. When the ship was finished, I think in Bremen Harbor, 200 people from Herrenhut went there to celebrate. And a year later, the ship went with the first missionaries here. And they created the first station, New Hermannsburg. And from there into Zululand. Then an amazing thing happened. You could say it's politics, but the ZAR, the South African Republic, and the Orange Free State, those two of Boer republics, they didn't like for some reason English missionaries, <laughs> uh, but they invited the Hermannsburgers and the Berliners, come, you can mission in our two states. And so a big thrust, the Berliners into the old Transvaal, right, uh, first starting Bocciabello, a wonderful, wonderful mission station, and then right into Benda, right up north. And the Hermannsburgers into the Free State, into the southern Transvaal, now the northwest province, and from there even into Botswana. And I think here, Leon, I'll say a few words that our nation was not only blessed by Germans, but by many other European nations. As I shared with you guys, I've been involved in France for the last 21 years, specifically because, because God spoke to us about our French Huguenot ancestry, especially as Afrikaners. Um, and to discover the influence that the French had on our nation was really an interesting journey. Um, not just a cultural journey, but especially a spiritual journey. To understand it, to be descendants of the French Huguenots is a high privilege. Because they were a people group that were persecuted for quite a long time. And when people get persecuted, they get cleansed. <laughs> they, they, it forces them to become a people more pure and more dedicated to God. And what we discovered about the French Huguenots really made us aware of the rich heritage that God made us receive, especially as Afrikaners originally, but then also as South Africa. Remember in 1688 we had the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in France where Louis XIV decided he's finished with these Huguenots, he doesn't want any of them in their com his country, and they were really very much persecuted. So the first influence that the French had in our nation was through our Huguenot forefathers. I think it still manifests, especially in the Africana today, that can be traced back to the Huguenot faith and the Huguenot way of seeing God and having the fear of the Lord. Even Andrew Murray said, when he was still alive, that there's something in the Africana that he said came from the Huguenot ancestors that they had. A God-fearing way of looking at the Lord. They were called les gens de, de la parole, the people of the word. They loved the word of God. And they were persecuted. You couldn't have a Bible in your possession in France, especially not in the language of the French. Um, and the French, if you go to us one day, hopefully some of you will be able to go to us with us to France, we see that they even hid small little Bibles in the women's hair to try and hide the Bibles from the soldiers if they came into their houses. They had special mirrors that had a place for the Bible to be hid so that the word could not be found by the soldiers of the Catholic King. Because if it was found, it was immediately a death sentence. We were not allowed to have the Bible. But they had such a love for the word of God. And to the point where they even taught their children at a very young age to read from the Bible. Because a Huguenot child, if he could read, he could receive his own Bible. This was one of the most wonderful things for a child to think that he could have his own Bible. So they were quite ahead of the Catholic children because they learned to read at home from the Bible. They were really people that loved the Word of God. They had a hard-working culture because it was defined from Scripture that they had to be people that work hard and that brought them some troubles 
from their Catholic, less hard-working colleagues in the country. They were purified by persecution and they were unwilling to recant their faith. They were not willing to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ, even though much pressure was placed on them to do exactly that. There was a willingness to lose everything in order to keep Jesus. There's not a lot of people in the history that have been through that test of losing everything, literally everything they owned, they lost, if they were not willing to say, we are we walking away from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we realize, as we went on, to, on in the journey, that the French had another impact on South Africa that we never knew about. And that most of you probably do not know about. And that is that the French impacted the Basutu people. The first three missionaries that came to the Basutu nation were French evangelical Christians from the uh, Paris Evangelical Missionary Society. And this is such a beautiful story um, that I believe every Basutu person needs to know and understand. Towards the end of 1832, Adam Krotz, a hunter, coming from the mission station of Philippoulis, established by the London Missionary Society, entered Meshweshwe's country and was immediately sent to the king. And he had a conversation with the king. Meshweshwe was really downcast because of all the wars that the Basutu people were pulled into. And he was tired of war. King Meshwesh was really somebody that was far ahead of his time, a wise man, and he sought peace. He had such a desire for peace. And he had, as he sat down with Adam Kotz, he was a chikwa, a hunter that moved around in the country. He asked this man, how can I find peace? Can't you get hold of a few guns for me? Maybe I will be able to get peace if I have guns that make me more powerful. And Adam Krot said to him, you will not find peace through guns. But I know of people that can bring peace to you. People that serve the Prince of Peace. And immediately the king said, please, I want them to come to my kingdom. And King Mishwesh sent 200 head of cattle with Adam Krot back to Philippoulis as a gift in order for them to send in people that can teach him how to find peace. Isn't that amazing? And unfortunately, the cattle were stolen on the way by another tribe, so he sent another 200 head of cattle to send a gift. I think it was stolen again, and he did it a third time. This is how desperate this man was to know peace. And when Adam Krotz came to Philippoulis, he came to a mission station where three young French missionaries just arrived out of France with the purpose of coming to evangelize at that sta stage the Twana people. But something happened and they had to get out of the land of the Twana people because of war. And this invitation came from King Mishwesh. Will you not send me people that can teach me about peace? So the Paris Evangelical Missionary Society's three young men Eugene Casalis, Thomas Arbusse, and Constant Gozela just arrived. Now, Constant Gozela was in his 30s, but the other two, I, th I know for a fact, Eugene Casalis was only 20 years old. This young man, at the age of 15 already, had a heart for the people of Africa and knew he would want, he will become a missionary into the nations of Africa. And uh, originally they started learning Arabic. To go and evangelize the Muslim nations and then that fell through and they had to come all the way to Southern Africa. French people had to come to the English Missionary Society and obviously learn English. And they came to King Mishwesh. He invited them and took their and they had a meeting with this king. And they shared with him that if he wanted peace they could help him. And that they would be willing to stay amongst these people. And they said to him, the fate of your people will be our fate. We are willing to live amongst you. And whatever happens to you, we are willing to go through the same. 
And as they shared this invitation with the king, the king said, My heart is white with joy. Stay with us. You shall teach us. You shall do what you wish. The land is at your disposal. I mean, what an invitation. And it's interesting, these three men, even as they were coming to Africa, God gave him Acts 16. The story of Paul being called by the Macedonian man. And they said, when this invitation came to them from a king of a tribe, they said, this is none other than the Macedonian call. God has opened a way for us. And they opened the first missionary station they called, it's now called Murija, Moriah, where the king gave them a piece of land and they started working amongst the Basutu people. And because of their work, the Basutu people came to the Lord Jesus Christ. The royal family, or people in the royal family, were, one of the, were the first converts into Christianity, even though the king resisted a bit longer because it was politically a bit more difficult for him. And in 2007, we had the opportunity to have an audience with the present king. And we had French believers that we brought from France to come and pray in South Africa. And as we met the king and sat with him, and he started sharing with us his gratefulness for the French nation, tears ran down his face. It's interesting, every Basutu knows about the French. Even the small children could tell us about the French because it's so in interwoven into their culture. God saved us through French missions. And they only have positive when they talk about the French. It's not like other nations where there was colonial power. The French didn't have power over the Basutus. They brought the gospel. And they even wrote hymns thanking God that they sing in their churches. Thanking God for the missionaries that he brought to the city. And the king stood before us with tears in his eyes and he says, If it was not for the French, my country would not exist today. He said, tell us more. He said, that young Casalis, Eugene Casalis, it's interesting when these missionaries came to the Basutis, they said, no, go, go back home, bring your fathers, you're still children. <laughs> they didn't even have beards. And the Basutis said, we can't talk to you, you're not men yet. We can't talk to people that are not men. Send your fathers. And they said, well, we're here. So it wasn't easy for, for them to start off with. And this young Casalis really, the king loved him. This young Frenchman, the king saw in him such wisdom and he made him his de facto minister of foreign affairs. And it is told the most favorite of the king was allowed to sleep at the feet of the king on a mat in the king's rondal. And Casalis was given that privilege to sleep at the king's feet. And when the king was wrestling with what will he do, because on the one side he's got the Zulus that's busy attacking him, on the other side the Boers, the Afrikaners, and his land was being taken away from him. What can he do to save his nation? Because he was losing his nation. This young Frenchman said, I tell you, go to the English and ask them to be an English protectorate so that you will save your nation. And because of that decision that a French missionary gave the king the nation of Lesotho still exists today and even the king of Lesotho recognizes this fact they ended cannibalism in Lesotho did you know there was cannibalism in Lesotho it was because of the French missionaries that that stopped they opened schools teaching the Basutus to read and write and even today Lesotho is seen as one of most one of the most literate the countries in Africa because of what the French uh, missionaries did. The French missionaries wrote down the Sutu language for the first time and started translating the Bible into Sutu. And they started defining so much of the spiritual life and religious life that the Basutus have today. The Basutus are very religious people. So we had to come to the place where we realized the Basutus are our brothers and sisters. Because you, know, you have two ways that you have an inheritance. One is in blood, and the other one is in spirit. And the spirit one is more powerful than the blood one. <laughs> we are the sons of Abram, not because we are the blood of Abram, but because we are the spiritual sons of Abram as believers today. And so we could look at our Basutu brothers and sisters and say, we have the same parents. 
We belong to the same family. And God has given us the privilege of taking some basutis with us to, the, uh, to, to France to, 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 to reconnect the spiritual fathers and mothers with one another. So the French had a major impact on that small little nation. And they had some missions also here in the Cape and, uh, uh, and had an impact in the Cape society. But I'm, only, I'm not going to share anything further. Um, they wrote a lot of hymns in Sutu, which was beautiful. They opened a printing press in Lesotho and started printing books in Sutu. They bought farming and other technologies. And we believe this is one of the most wonderful ways for us to come together. You know, for us as white people that have French you know, ancestry and for Basutu people who are part of the black tribes of Africa to say that we have the same family. There's no difference between us. We belong together. We need to do the things of the uh, kingdom together. A few pictures. Those people here know this part of history, the Cape. Like Leon shared about the Basutu. The Moravians know every piece of history. How do they know it? Because those Germans meticulously wrote down every name. I was so thrilled two days ago, going for a morning walk in Kanaandal, discovering a memory stone called the Eerstelinge. And there are the six names. The first coin Maybe the first Southern Africans baptized, receiving God's impartation. And obviously, Magdalena was one of those names. Amazing, just to show you the amazing spirit that drove those missionaries. While they came to the coin, they went to the furthest corners of the earth. Do you know where Labrador is? It's ice country north of Canada. They created Hebron there. Hebron mission station among the Eskimos. The same people from Herrenwood. If I say we were in Shiloh, maybe a show of hands where Shiloh is. Anybody knows? There's one, two, Three. So our nation in Pretoria, nobody uh, will know. That is why we also take in the seminar. Shiloh is not so far from Queenstown. And what we discovered, the spirit that was planted there, of work ethic, of a Christian community, they're not all Moravians, but all the community leaders we met in Shiloh, they were brothers and sisters in Christ. It was so beautiful what we saw a big, big dairy, an irrigation farm where the cattle were grazing, all managed by the people of Shiloh. You can see, maybe not, that we were very happy. They brought out a bottle of Nkosi Pinotage and we tasted it together. It was such a joy. The first wine produced in the Eastern Cape by a Christian community that still had that spirit that missionaries brought. If I asked where the name of Clarkson comes from, a show of hands. One, yeah, two, three, I think that I must share because that was a discovery for all of us on our journey, the importance of slavery in our history. Clarkson, I think it was Thomas Clarkson, was a major person in the abolition of slavery in the British Parliament and this community remembers him and called their village Clarkson. What happened when the slaves were freed, 1834 I believe, uh, they flocked to the mission stations because there they were received as brothers and sisters. In Elam is a memorial to that date, the day when the slaves in South Africa were freed.
wonderful, this little town of Clarkson has three suburbs, Clarkson, uh, Lansdowne. Lansdowne and Smarty Town, that is the bit of upper class uh, part of Clarkson. Wonderful. Hear the prayers when we met with a young lady pastor, uh, Reverend Chandra. What did she pray for? What was on her heart against the abuse of women and children, even in those former mission societies in a place like Clarkson? That is what we need to pray against. But beautiful, a young woman praying for the darkness of a journey to be lifted. As we said, we had met half an hour before by a candlelight dinner. And then a coy leader, what did he pray for? For the word to find its rightful place again in our nation. Community leader, Elder Jerome, for gratitude to come back. Dank mense nog aan die woord dankbaarheid. Dankbaarheid wat ons vandaag oor gepraat het. Dankbaar wat God 300 jaar geleden gedoen het. And so beautiful, the Spirit touched us all and we sang together something that we all knew. Read your Bible and pray every day. Genadendal this picture of the church in Genadendal is the picture of the church in Harrenhut where eight of us were at the wedding. This is the heritage that we have in South Africa. But they also, the other thrust, the Hermannsburgers, had a tough time in Zululand. Not only because the Zulus were a proud nation and their leadership were very concerned that that would change the culture of the Zulus. But at the same time, the Zulus were suspicious of every white man because it was only 15 years later that the Anglo-Boer War broke out. And virtually every mission station, 10 at least, were burned down in that war that the Hermannsburgers established. So when the South African Republic, the Boer Republics, invited the Hermannsburgers come to us. The next thrust came into there. And beautiful, our journey of discovery in the Cape continued in the Transvaal. We found the whole Northwest province, at least 40 mission stations. Names like Hebron, Jericho, Dino Kana. It was the first gospel that people heard in Northwest Province. I came to a church, to a service, through a missionary, a German missionary, said, come to us in Acacia, in Pretoria North. Completely three languages spoken, Swana, Pedi, and English. Alternate, a brass band. When the brass band and the organ played together on that day, I just couldn't hold back. <laughs> It was so, so beautiful. That community in Acacia, the Elksa Lutheran Church, started in the garage in Pretoria North. And then uh, from 1994, black people were moving into the area and Afrikaners were moving out. And within four years, these poor people managed to buy a Dutch Reformed church that had 2,000 members and three predicante. It is now this beautiful Lutheran church with organ, uh, brass band. That is the spirit that carries you and builds you up also in physical development. So beautiful. I wish Christine could share a word how Prayer is so important in the Moravian Church. The blue jersey is she's a prayer sister. That's her ministry, prayer. But then when we prayed with them, their worship is prayer. 
We sat and sang with them. All their eyes were closed as they worshipped. They were praying to the Father. These beautiful, beautiful prayer sisters. So wonderful. This emblem took the missionaries to the far corners of the earth from heavenhood. And it says, our Lamb has conquered. Let us follow Him. And this is still the emblem and motto of the Moravian Church today. It brought people. Thanks so much. Let's go to the last slide. The last, second last. The Spirit. There's now a lot of theological discussion of that Spirit and a lot of political discussion. But let me read it to you, what Theodor Harms from the Lüneburger Heath Hermannsburg wrote in 1857. Never forget that you are Lutheran uh, missionaries. Lutheran was not a denomination, it was the Reformation people. You are Lutheran ministries and have undertaken to teach according to Lutheran confession and using pure Lutheran sacraments. Also never forget that you are Germans and must cling to the German language and tradition as a jewel given to you by God. And as Hermannsburg missionaries, you may never become lords, but must remain servants. And the last word, I think, from Isaac Barley, for many years, head headmaster of the MLB at the high school in Van Aardendaal, then for many years building up the museum there. To me that is the way forward we have to take from here. Isaac Barley said, to respect our past and thus know with all confidence and no ignorance which way to go. Where does that confidence come to? Jesus is the portion my inheritance.